Okay, I think we can start. So today we are gonna present the, the work we've we've done for almost a year with Wilshard to support uh, MLC NAND in the um, in the kernel. So I am Boris Brezion and I'm working for Frederick Trends and I'm Richard Weinberger and working for Sigma Star GmbH and we are both doing consulting in the area of embedded Linux and this project we are working both on and had a lot of fun with MLC in the end. and now will Boris give you a short introduction to MLC and then I will take over and tell you more, more details on, on UBI and other stuff. Yes, so you know SLC NAND is, supporting for, is supported for a long time now and it started to, to begin uh, to, to be bored. We started to be bored. And so NAND vendors decided to uh, <laughs> invent a new thing to, to, to let us keep our, our job. So they invented MLC NAND. <laughs> Um, uh, so let's see a bit uh, what the constraints are for uh, on MLC NANs. So the first one is kind of well known and expected. Uh, you get reduced lifetime, which means you have fewer erase cycle, program erase cycle. Um, you also um, have to program all the pages in the ascending order. We'll see later why. Um, we have data retention issues, but we already had those issues with SLC NANs. The only difference is that uh, we have a lot of them. <laughs> and yeah, it, it tends to, uh, um, to um, complicate a lot the, the process. Um, we also have the paired pages pro problem, which I will detail a bit later, and again, I don't know if non vendors try to be mean with us, but <laughs> that's that's a bit hard to deal with. And the unstable bits problem, which um, when you design your board, you you'd better make sure you have uh, some capacitors to to be able to finish the program or erase operation you are doing before the the real power cut happens. So we'll see if we can solve that. So the first one is the reduced lifetime. Actually, this is not a big issue because UBI has been designed to distribute the word over the whole device. And the only thing you have to uh, do here is just tweak a bit the configuration and that should work pretty well. Um, the second issue we have is the um, data retention issue. And before I describe that one, I just want to show you uh, what's the difference between an SLC cell and an MLC cell. So in SLC cell, you have only two levels. One is erased and one is P1, in which the bit is set to zero. And in MLC cell, you have uh, four different levels. Um, this means you can only uh, go from the bottom to the top and then when you want to go back to the erase state, you have to erase the, the wall block. So um, why is it the, a problem for a data retention? Um, this is uh, mainly because of uh, um, read and write disturbance. So with MLC cells, since you have uh, more levels, this means the, the distance between the levels are smaller and you're more, like, more likely to switch from one state to another if you have some charge loss or if you gain some electrons. So this is uh, partly why MLC NANs tend to be uh, more sensitive to, uh, to read and write disturbance. Um, you also, um, the fact that MLC cells are smaller and are closer than uh, are closer together means that each time you have to program or read a page, the disturbance is even uh, uh, stronger. So here, um, the only solution we have to to deal with that is either to increase the ECC level, ECC strength, 
but then again, you'll hit the problem at some point. So no matter the existing strengths you put, you'll have to detect that you reach a level of bit flips that you can't handle and just move the data somewhere else. And this is what, uh, actually, this is what UBI is doing. UBI is, uh, when UBI reads a block, it checks the number of bed flips and says, oh, this block is going to be unreadable soon. I'm going to move the data somewhere else. Um, so yes, I just said that before. Then comes the uh, bird pages problem. Um, Actually, this is one of the biggest problems we have with MLC. Um, so let's go back to the MLC cell diagram. Um, you see that you have two bits inside the cell. And that would be too easy for us if the two bits were assigned to the same page. So then vendors decided to assign them to two different pages. <laughs> And each time you uh, want to program one of the bits, so you have to first to program the, the low, lower bit and then the upper bit. And each time you want to program one of the bits, you have to change from one state to another. And if you look at the different states we have here, um, if the first bit you want to keep it to one, and then you want to program the second bit to uh, zero, then you have to go from erase state to P3. And if you have a power cut in the middle, you not only corrupt the, the, the second bit, which is kind of expected by the upper layers, but you also corrupt the first bit, which was already programmed before and assumed to be safe. So this is kind of breaking a simple rule which uh, a lot of people were rely, relying on. So that's, that's the problem we have, we have with third pages. So that's um, the reason NAND vendors ask you to program all the pages in, in ascending order. And actually, it's a bit worse than that. Because if you look at the, the pairing scheme we have in the wild, so this is just an example. We have different pairing scheme, but this one is already uh, quite complex. So you see that. Uh, lower pages and upper pages are kind of interleaved, which means you can say, okay, even if my page is uh, 8 kilobytes, let's say that my page is actually 16 kilobytes and I program twice the page and at once. And that's not possible because they, they decided to interleave the, the pages. Actually, I think they have good reason to do that. But it's not clearly explained in the data sheet. I, I, I guess uh, they do that to improve performances and also mitigate the write disturbance. But maybe someone in the audience can give some clue. No? OK, so anyway, it's how it works, and it's kind of painful to deal with. And the last problem we have, um, actually, this is not something we experienced during our test. But some people reported that um, if you almost finish the program or erase operation, you might be uh, able to read back the data after the power cut, but only once. So you read back the valid data once, and then when you read back again, read it, read it back again, it's invalid. And again, that's a problem because uh, UBI and UBIFS, they don't know uh, which block was programmed last. And we don't have that information right now. So since we never faced that, and it's not really described in uh, data sheets, or NAND vendors tend to say, no, my NAND is immune to that which I don't trust. <laughs> but since we never seen that, we decided to kind of ignore the problem. And my guess is that it's not just a black and white problem. It's a bit more subtle. So my guess is that if you interrupt a program operation in the, at the end of the op operation, you might be able to read the data back. But you'll probably see a lot of bit flips. And 
if UBI sees a lot of bit flips, it will, it will decide to move the data somewhere else. So hopefully we'll, we are kind of sa safe against the unstable bit problem. Um, but yes, if some NAND vendors are able to give us some more clue about the, this problem, that, that would be great. Um, then there was some problems we were not, uh, um, we didn't knew before working on, on the solution. So the main problem is that um, we, sh we saw that if you uh, don't write the block completely, so if you only write partially the, the blocks, then you will see a lot of bit flips in the last pages you programmed. And you have so much bit flips that if you read several times the same page, the same last set of pages, you will have the read disturb effect, which will generate even more bit flips, and soon the page will become unreadable. So that's not really a problem, because UBI is able to detect that and move the data to somewhere else. But this means that, in this case, UBI keeps moving data around, and it just works the, the NAND uh, much faster. So yes, that's something uh, we discovered, and we, uh, that, that would be better if we uh, knew that before. So this is what we called the open block issue. Um, well, we also discovered some good thing. Uh, the main one and the one that we are relying for our solution is that you can program um, blocks in SLC mode. So in, by SLC mode, I, I mean it's a software, software emulated SLC mode, which means you only program the lower pages of each block. And of course, it works. It solves the page, paired pages problem. Uh, it, tends to, uh, solve, it tends to show uh, less bit flips in those pages. And those pages tend to be less sensitive to uh, read write, dis write disturbance. But the main drawback with that solution is that you lose half the capacity, and that's not really acceptable. So just one last word about the name constraints. Yeah, that would be good to have some more information from NAND vendors, because right now we are just uh, trying things and failing, and then trying to understand why it's not working and why the NAND is acting uh, weird. So yes, please, NAND vendors, share the share some more information. So now I'll let um, Richard talk a bit about UBI and then present the, the solution. We we yeah. developed. So now a few words on UBI basics because later we will dive into the details and we have to make sure that you know the the UBI basics. First of all. Um, UBI nomenclature, mm, that's something often gets wrong and people get horrible, horrible confused by it. Um, as you know, UBI is a mapping between logical and physical erase blocks. All blocks UBI presents to the user is actually only a logical block and is then mapped to a real physical block. That's why we have the notation of the BEB, that's the physical erase block and the LEB, the logical erase block. That's the easy part. Then, um, what most people get wrong is the UBI image. The UBI image is this file or, or dump that you have on your empty partition. For example, the tool UBNICE creates you a UBI image, and then you flash this image onto your MTT. Can be one, one empty partition, or also the whole NAND. Then, at, at the runtime, we have the UBI device. That means when we start UBI and UBI scans the whole partition and is ready to work, then we have the UBI device. It is also being found under slash dev. It's always UBI and, and a number. And then we have also UBI volumes. Just think of the logical volume manager we have for block devices. That's something for flash. So 
UPI offers you a way to partition your, your UPI device in multiple parts, namely the UPI volumes. That means you can have multiple UPI FS instances on the same UPI device. Please never ever create multiple UPI devices on your NAND unless you really know what you're doing. Yesterday we had a nice discussion on that, that at some point it makes sense to, to have multiple UP instances when you want to make sure that the wear labeling won't hurt a specific part on your NAND. Okay, but actually you should have the wear labeling domain as large as possible. So, and then finally we have the word attach. That's basically the the process of loading and starting UBI because UBI has to scan either the fast map or the full flash image and this process is called attach. So when you when you report me a bug on a mailing list, then I ask you does UB attach work and then you know now what I mean. So and now how does UBI look on your flash? Um, does this cursor work? It's really small. Uh, no, no cursor? Okay. Um, we have the, the logical erase blocks on the top. Um, the logical erase block number starts always with a zero and starts with zero for each volume. That means when we have one volume, then we have n erase blocks starting by by zero, but when we have multiple volumes, then the logical erase block number always starts with zero. And the user above UBI, for example, UBI FS, only sees the logical erase blocks. That's, that's important to know because UBI FS may report LEB number five is bad, then I know that's the fifth logical block. It's not the physical block. Sometimes people get this wrong and then do a to an end dump and go in the hex viewer and search the offset of the fifth block and get confused. So then you see in the next row the physical erase blocks. Obviously the physical erase blocks start by, by one and go to n, but they, are, they have only one, one instance for, for each number. UBI just starts numberating then by, by the, by the um, offset zero and goes up to n. Um, every logical erase block has a mapping to a physical one. Of course, it can also have multiple mappings because UBI does copy on write. This operation is called the atomic lab change. That means you can change the a logical, a logical erase block atomically. We need this to preserve power cut safety. For example, when UBI FS starts writing a new journal head, then it finds which logical erase block number has the journal, and then it says, okay, I update the data, and then it just does an, an, an atomic lab change, and for a small time frame, we have on our flash two copies of the same logical erase block data, but since we have a sequence counter, UBI can decide which one is, is the newer one. And of course, we have also a, a checksum when we do a copy, that means, when we face a power cut and the data is not fully written, we can use the checksum to find out that we have that, that we had a problem while writing the, 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 the new copy and can just go down to the old one. So um, each, each physical erase block has two UBI headers, meaning the erase counter header, also referred as EC header, and the volume header, also often called the volume ID header. These are two, hab two headers. As soon as UBI finds a free physical erase block, it immediately places the erase counter header on this block. The purpose of this header is, as the name says, preserving the erase counter because UBI wants to know how often each block has been erased for purposes of wear labeling. And as soon a physical erase block gets assigned to a logical erase block, then the volume header is placed onto. The volume header contains the logical erase block number and the volume ID. 
adding some other details, but for now we only focus on the volume ID and the logical erase block. Is this clear so far? Do you have any questions? That's the basic concept how UBI works. Oh, nice. A room full of UBI experts. I have more questions. <laughs> so, Boris said for, before um, we can write uh, a physical erase block. Uh, just, um, I'm too fast. First, how does the how does the header and whole structure look like on SLC and ends? As I said before, we have the erase counter header and the volume ID header. So far, so good. Now the now the the first um, special trick comes into place, namely subpages. On SLC and ends, you can write a single patch into multiple steps. In data sheets, you find this as the NOP, NOP, the number of programs. It's typically four. That means you can program a single page in four steps. And that's why Linux says when it finds an SLC in the end, that we can have four subpages for each page. And that's why UBI is able to place the erase counter header and the volume ID header into a single page. Otherwise, we would have to waste two pages for the metadata. Here in the graphic, you see it as that both headers are in the in the page P0. That means we we have an overhead being from UB only by one page. That's rather acceptable. And the other pages are used for the payload of the of the logical erase block, meaning the real data you can use. For example, used by UBI FS. So now a few words on the data retention issues, mostly because they are really, really visible on on MLC. On on SLC, you have a hard time to to, to, re, to reproduce them. On MLC, you see them really fast. So mm, on MLC, you face mostly read disturb. For example, on an SLC in the end, you have to read the same page a few hundred thousand times just to hit a single bit flip due to um, read disturb. On the MLC, when you're unlucky, um, 500 reads are, are enough. So that's a real problem. So uh, the typical solution to deal with read, dis with read disturb is detecting bit flips before we have more bit flips, then we can correct and scrub the block. Scrubbing means we copy the data to other block, and and after a, a fresh programming, then then the, the bit flips are are repaired. To deal with that, and for, and mostly to do more experiments with that, we have the UBI health daemon. It's actually a very simple user space program that can fetch from UBI statistics how often each page has been has been read and then UBI health demon decides okay let's trigger a scrub. Now more on this slide mm. on a typical SSC in the end you have a cron job which reads from time to time your ho your whole UBI volume and that's basically enough. I write here on SLC without FastMap for a reason, because FastMap is a nice optimization for UBI to have a fast boot up because it doesn't have to scan all pages. When we do a disk dump from UBI mm, zero underscore whatever, then we read only a volume and we, we read only the, the payload, not the metadata. That means we can only address read disturb issues on the metadata and the, the volume headers and also the, the internal UBI um, volumes are only read during boot up. That means on SLC you are, you're only safe when you do from, kind of, from time to time a reboot without fast map and do a disk dump. On, on MLC this is not enough and that's why we had the UBI health daemon. The disk dump command is also not so nice because of course, um, you have to, to you have to read the, the, the whole volume, and 
it will introduce a large I.O. load and maybe your, your real-time application will block whatever. It's not nice. And that's, we have the UBI health daemon. You can tell the daemon, okay, please make sure that with a time frame from one month, the whole NAND chip will be read, blocked by block. And then the health daemon will, will, will start read commands after a few hours. He will just make sure that within a given time frame, the whole NAND is being read and read disturb is being addressed. We're currently not sure whether it makes sense to keep UBI health daemon as user space program. When it turns out that it can be solved easily in the kernel, we will move into the kernel. But for now, we keep it in, in user space just to do more, more experiments with, with, spe with specific um, write and read patterns and such things. We also use it as a small reporting tool to get known um, which application introduces which read load because sometimes you have a, a rough application with, which reads a lot of data and maybe start read disturb more soon and you may have demon can tell you. So, and now I will hand over to Pardon? Um, could we have the read counters form? Can you save the Pardon? Could we have the counters form? Well, we have the read counters form. Um, actually, I've, I've added a new interface to, 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 to UBI which exports the read counters and UBI has an in-memory in counter where, where it exports them to the daemon. And the daemon then has a configuration file where he can store the counters. Of course. But we also say it doesn't matter when the counters are not precise. For example, when, you, when we have a power cut before the daemon was able to, to dump down the stats and we lose two days of recounters, it doesn't really matter because we don't need exact numbers. We only need a rough measurement. How often is this read roughly? It doesn't matter whether it's read 5,000 times or 6,000 times. It was often read. Yes, of course, the, the daemon writes the file more often than a, than a single month. And you can also um, dump these counters into a, a UBI static volume. Then you don't have to have it as file on UBI FS. So and now we'll hand over to, to Boris and he will talk about the, the bird pages issue. Yes, yeah, so, um, so we saw that we need to program blocks in SLC mode. And in order to do that, the uh, upper layers need to know where are the lower pages, where are the upper pages. Um, actually, this was the easy part. Uh, we just needed to expose an API which is providing a way to retrieve uh, which page is a low page, which page is uh, an upper page, and that's all. Um, so this part should be, uh, or at least some part of it should be in the 4.9 kernel, and the rest should be uh, in the 4.10 kernel. So then you need to patch the upper layers. And with UBI, UBIFS, you have two solutions. Either you uh, do that in UBI, and UBIFS is absolutely not aware of this paired pages problem, or you try to handle that in uh, UBIFS. So the first uh, approach we tried is to solve that in UBIFS. Um, and inside UBIFS, you have two approaches. So either you um, try to write everything in SLC mode and then consolidate the data afterwards, or you try to write everything in MLC mode and then when you want to secure the data, you just skip the pages, skip some pages, and try to uh, start to write new pages but uh, far enough so that the, the previous pages are protected. Uh, the pros for this approach is that UBIFS knows better than anyone which data is valid and which data is dirty, and so it can select which blocks uh, should be consolidated and which one should not. 
Um, and UBFS knows when data needs to be protected. So when the user space do, does a sync on, on the file, then we need to protect the data. So that's why we try to, to do that in UBFS first. Um, actually, the solution two was not possible because of the uh, pairing scheme we've seen. So the interleaving pages and the open block issue. So we tried that, but it didn't work. And I also tried to implement solution one, but uh, after a day or two trying to modify the UBAFS implementation, I, j I just realized it was too invasive to, to be acceptable. So then we decided to go for the uh, UBA, uh, UBI implementation. Um, I let Richard describe what we did. So, yeah, and then we came on a came on a idea how to implement a problem, how to, how to solve the problem, not implement in UBI. <laughs> so, and the basic idea is, we we write every logical erase block by default in SLC mode, meaning we use only half the pages, and we of course waste half of the space. But as soon when we run out of three blocks, then we combine or consolidate two logical erase blocks into one block where both both page bars are used, namely the lower page and the high page, and that way we can gain one more free block. That means mm, that we can combine two partitionally written, written blocks into one fully written block. And so all we have to do is is teaching UBI to, to know when to combine blocks and then we, it can produce us a, a new free blocks. That way we can use over time all pages and pretty easy, problem solved, let's go home. Oh, no, there are more, there are more slides, there are more, more issues. So, now in detail. On the left hand side, no, doch, this is your Right hand side. Left. <laughs> you see the the life cycle of a logical erase block without LEB consolidation, namely on, on SLC in the end. By default, we start in the unmapped state, and as soon we start writing, it's in the open state. That means we can append more data or also unmap it. As soon as we write to the last page, the the block is considered as full. And then we can, can only unmap it again, namely also erase it and then start writing again. On the, with LAB consolidation, we have a little bit more states, which I will explain you now. First, we start again with the state unmapped. Then again, we can start writing, being in the state open. And then, as soon as we write the last page, then UBI has it as a candidate for LAB consolidation. That means UBI now knows, okay, this one is full, and when I find another full one, I can combine them to a fully written one. Then it, then it is in the state consolidated. That means when we have a physical erase block, which hosts two LABs, both LABs are in state consolidated. Now consider the the, the unmap, we have the physical erase block, which hosts two, two LEPs, and we unmap one LEP. Then we have a problem, because we cannot change the data, because we can only erase the whole physical erase block. But when we, when we erase the whole one, then we would also kill the data from the other logical erase block we'd, we'd, we still need. That means this block we would, we we are willing to unmap is now in state invalid. That means the data is still here, but UBI must not use it. And as soon both LEPs are in state invalid, then we can actually erase the block. We will hear more details on this later because it's, it introduces uh, some interesting corner cases. So I think I have to speed up a little bit. Um, 
on the slide here, I said everything. Um, one question, why can we only consolidate LEDs with, which are full? The answer is, when they are consolidated, we are using high and low pages, and then we can no longer change the data, because when we would change the data, then up on a power cut, we would kill already written data. That's we only consolidate full LEDs. So, um, now we extend our existing UBI nomenclature for the following terms. We have an SLC LEP, that means it's a logical erase block that sits only on the low pages. This is also a candidate for consolidation when it, it is full. The full LEP is when the, when the last page is written. We actually don't know whether it is completely written, we only care about the about the last page, because when the last page is written, you can no longer write a page in between. Then we have the CLEP, it's the LEP which is consolidated, meaning it sits on a physical erase block with more LEPs on it. So, and here a short time frame. It's also, also very important, when should UBI start with consolidation, because when we would only start with consolidation, when we run out of space, then the whole system may be slowed down. That's, wh that's why we have a trigger when UBI decides that, we, that it, is, it still has three blocks, but does, does already consolidation and produces three blocks in advance. Here we see that we have two full LEPs, LEP zero and one, and one empty one. And then we start writing to the empty one, being then LEP X, X. And then we, we go over the threshold watermark and UBI starts with consolidation and consolidates LEP 0 and LEP 1 into the states C LEP 0 and C LEP 1. And it produced one more empty block. So, when we have an MLC in end and write a, an LEB in, in SLC mode, then we only use the, the low pages. Here, for example, we have the erase counter header being on the page zero, which is a low page, and the volume ID header being on the page one, which is also a low page. One interesting fact is MLC has no subpages. That means we have to waste two pages for the UBI headers. That's not so nice because on MLC typically the pages are larger, but we have to use two pages. And then the payload is also used only is also only stored on the low pages. Here, for example, we have page three and page n minus two, and the other high pages are ignored. On the other hand, when we have um, consolidated LEPs, then the layout looks like the following. We have on the first page, again, the erase counter header, and then on the next page, we have both volume ID headers. And then we have the payload for, for, for both logical erase blocks. And important, we have to add at the bottom a bedding. That's the open block issue powers mentioned before, we have to fully write the, the block. And of course, the stored data is, is immutable, we cannot change it. So now, some problems we had, or some challenges. A typical SLC NAND, we have as many LEPs as we have PEPs, because the mapping is one-to-one, -one. easy. On MLC, it is one to two. That means we have twice as many LEPs as we have physical erase blocks. This is clear, because we're just using half the data, but we have in some, the whole data, we have to provide as twice as many LEPs, but when we combine them, then we have to, the full storage again. That led to some interesting issues because within UBI on many places the number of LEPs is actually used as number of PEPs and nobody noticed and nobody cared to change and yeah, we figured the hard way. 
for example, that there's also an, an issue in the SysFS API where actually UBI exports the number of, of, of LEPs, but the user space tools think it's the other ones and get probably, get probably confused. But these are all only the minor issues. One problem is also that you cannot assume that you can actually use all, all LEPs. You have to you have to have to reserve a few for the internal housekeeping. For example, when you have two full LEPs, you you have to combine them into into one new block to, 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 to gain a, a new block. You need one more block as temporary copy because we do copy on write. We cannot change existing data. Yeah, and we need some guarantees from the UBI user, namely UBIFS. UBIFS has to fill the LEPs completely, namely it has to write the last page, and it has to has to has to not to open um, many LEPs in parallel. For example, when UBIFS would write one page into every LEP, then it would, would run out of space, but we could not combine them anymore because the last page is, 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 is never written. But luckily, UBIFS turned out to, to, to be really smart and, and always tries to fill up a single LEP as much as possible before it claims a new one. But we also have to know how many open LEPs we can have. For example, for UBIFS, we have um, one for the journal head, one for the late property tree. It's a number around, around five. That means we have to hold back at least five blocks to be able to do LAB consolidation. Otherwise, we, we would run out of space while, while producing, producing space. And now one a really fancy corner case. Usually, UBI can deal with the fact that you ha have, an, have, an, have an old LEP on your flash that is no longer used. It can happen when you have a power cut doing a copy and write operation, then you have two versions. Um, when we have now a physical erase block that contains the LEP X and Y, but then unmap the, the LEP X, then it is instead invalid. That means the data is still present, but we would like to get rid of it. So far, so good. When now the user above UBIFS claims a new LEB with the same number, for example, X again, then we have two copies of, of, of LEB X. One in SLC mode and one in MLC mode, which is invalid. And now what UBI can do, uh, UBIFS can do is unmapping and deleting the, the newest copy of LEPX, and we have the, 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 the old LEPX still present. And when we now have a power cut, we end up with the old copy as the newest one, and UBIFS has a, a few corner cases where it does probing for LEP and then finds, oh, this one is still present, I will use it. And then it's using old data and leads to interesting failures. The solution is either having a lock in UBI, implementing a journal that's impossible or really a lot of work. What we do is what was fixing UBIFS, namely um, finding, the, 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 finding the places within UBIFS where it does an, an unmap erase by hand. Yes, the question. There is no flag. There's only. It's only in run, right? Yeah. Yes. Because we cannot write. And unmapping is the same problem then? When you have an um, LED that's meant to be unmapped, how is that going to work with UBI? In SLC mode or in MLC? In SLC, it's so, it doesn't care because when you say UBI, please unmap me this LED, and then it is queued for for erasure, that's asynchronous, either erasure happened or it happened not. Because um, UBI assumes that the user above it 
does the housekeeping on its own. It knows UBIFS does only unmap a block when it does no longer need it. So it's not a fully FTL, it's only a kind of FTL and, and says the user has to do the housekeeping. So and now um, we had to turn some, some unmap and erase operations into actually atomic lab change operations within UBIFS and that solved the problem because now um, we have the same LAP always referenced and the housekeeping of UBI works again. So I'm now really late and hand over to Boris for the conclusion because the, the zombie LAP problem is solved but there are more problems. Yes, so uh, basically we uh, managed to use MLC NAND uh, with UBI and UBIFS. And actually, if you want to use the prototype, all you'll have to uh, do is maybe create a UBI image using UBNize. So when you create the image, you'll have to pass a few more things, like which pairing scheme is used on this NAND, um, that's pretty much all you'll need. The UBNize, uh, the new UBNize binary will be able to build the correct image for you. Um, as I told at the beginning of the, of the talk, we already have most of the PCs for uh, exposing the pairing scheme in the kernel, which is good. We already have uh, most ECC engine which are able to do strong, strong ECC. So the one we are using is the all-winner all -winner controller and it's doing up to 64 bits per kilobyte. So that's already good. Um, yeah, so keep in mind that you should use UBI else daemon because otherwise you'll see uh, bit flips sooner, but it works. Yeah. I, I think I'll let Richard answer that one. So the question was whether we can create a heat map of your NAND. Um, I have no tool to create me a heat map, but you can use the file that UBI Health Demon creates. It's basically um, a text file containing the counters, and you can use the scripting language you like and create a bitmap. But the UBI Health Demon is currently heavy changed, and we are not so sure what we should do with it. Maybe we integrate it into the kernel, maybe we make it more advanced and keep it. Currently, we use it to, to play with it. So yeah, it, it, as I said, the solution works, but it's not perfect. And for example, lab consolidation is slow because you need to completely lock the, the labs before consolidating. Otherwise, one could just unmap the lab, the lab while you are consolidating it or, or just update it. So that's kind of, um, yeah, that's expensive to consolidate labs together. Uh, we saw that we have a problem with uh, space reservation. Uh, a few problems with the lab and PEP concepts, which have to be clarified. And another thing that we think sh we should change is um, the fact that we only cons consolidate the full labs. And actually, this may not be the best uh, decision because Imagine you have a lab which is updated a lot, but each time it is updated, it's completely filled. And even if it's full, there's no, um, it's, it's useless to consolidate this lab because it will be just unmapped soon. So instead of doing uh, the uh, lab consolidation only on full labs, we will try to uh, maintain um, an LRU, which is uh, this time least recently updated uh, database. 
and we'll all try to update, uh, to, to consolidate the, the ones which are uh, uh, least recently, uh, least updated. So that's, that's the plan. Um, yeah, it, it still needs works. It's, it's currently being, being worked on, but it's not, it's not finished yet. Um, so we are working on a, a version relaxing the uh, consolidation thing, um, fixing the PEB reservation, and re reworking the consolidation uh, stuff. So I didn't put any GitHub URL because it's not in a good shape. So, <laughs> but if you want some more information or want to access the repository, just ask on the MTD mailing list, and I'll I'll provide the, the links. Yeah. Sorry. This is obviously a proof of concept, but have you submitted some patches? Um, we posted uh, actually Richard posted an RFC. Yeah, actually, since I'm the main designer, I have to I have to preview my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that's a big problem. Um, um, currently, there are not so many UBI experts out there, and even less guys from from NAND vendors who are willing to help. So I posted sometimes mails with what we are doing and with links in patches, but um, there was not much feedback. So when you have an MLC NAND device and want to test, please, maybe we can solve a few issues, but um, currently Boris and I are more or less on our own. That's not a nice situation, but well, that's it. Yes? Do you have an approximate model for MLC flash? Like a software model that fed the these motors? No, we don't. You mean something like a MLC support for, for NANSIM? Uh, actually, that can be done using Nansim, um, and I have some batches for Nansim to to add the fancy stuff from MLC, but the the really odd things you you face only on the real hardware. On my desk being now such a, a pile of bricked Nans, <laughs> 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 that works best. So we have a customer who is willing to give hardware to, to us. That's good. <laughs> But we don't have a formal language um, model. Yes? What, what is the performance uh, impact of all the consolidation? So the question is what is the performance impact? Currently, the impact is rather high because on MLC NAND, uh, a block could be multiple megabytes. And consolidation means you have to copy around and read multiple megabytes. That's one of the issues we want to get rid before we, we mainline that. So currently, the impact is rather high. Can you uh, give us a figure as compared to the I, We don't have numbers, but uh, yeah. When the, the NAN start, when the UBI volume starts to be filled, so a lot of SLC labs uh, in there, and consolidation takes place, then you see a, uh, a slowdown, yeah. And we didn't do any measurement because the, the main goal was to get reliable support for MLC and not getting the best performances. But that's something we are taking into account for the, the second version. So you will probably do some measurements for the second version. Yeah. So if I understand this correctly, as, the, as you get very close to the NAND actually becoming... E, e, um, ...reducing degradation of performance. Yeah. It was not half full, it's, yeah. It would be a very to get rid of it. Yeah, that, that's why we start consolidating in, in background. But the way the consolidation is done, uh, which is led by, or uh, two labs by two labs, it's, 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 um, this is where the tension is, so. Yeah. Uh, can you that only when 
No, because as soon as uh, um, a PEB is containing an invalid lab, then it's uh, a new candidate for uh, consolidation. So you can... Yeah. Yeah, it could still be on the flash. It will probably happen that I'm consolidating two LEDs which both contain dirty data. data. Yeah. That's yeah, but if you want to put the, the logic at the UBA level, then you have to accept that. Yeah, we thought about that. Maybe we'll add something to say from UBIFS, okay, this LEB is containing a lot of dirty data. Please don't consolidate that one. But currently, that, that's not done. So the last question, yeah. When we use in uh, read-only mode, so we are going to make the calculations always like it's going to be in SLC mode? Yeah, um, actually, I'm working on... Uh, an SLC mod at the volume level, which uh, you will you will be able to create a wall volume, which will always operate in SLC mod. And actually, for read-only volume, static volumes, it's not so useful to write in SLC mod. So you can just write in MLC mod and pad the last block with zeros, for example, and then you you're safe because this is read-only volume and you won't write on it. Uh, UBI is just uh, moving the data around, and when it's when it's doing that, then the wall block is compiled somewhere else. So that's that should work. Thanks. <laughs>